It's been another wild week in Starbase, with vehicles rolling to the pad, more testing happening, another full stack, and somehow there's yet another Starship ready to be tested. What's up, Star fans? I'm Jack Byer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update. Let's start right where we left off in our last Starbase update with Ship 28 being installed on suborbital pad B. We were obviously expecting some testing, as SpaceX doesn't really install ships on the testing pads just for the sake of it, with some exceptions. And right on cue, we had a spin prime of Ship 28's engines at the beginning of the week. Looking at the footage, it kind of looks like only three engines were tested, which would line up with our previous sightings of at least three engines being either removed and then reinstalled, or completely changed out for new ones. While all of this was happening, we also saw a lot of testing from the orbital tank farm as well. After Booster 10 was removed from the orbital launch mount, a lot more work was done on the tank farm and the mount itself, probably to fix whatever caused the aborts during the wet dress rehearsal attempts. It makes sense to then test these fixes, and what better way to do that than when the road is closed for other unrelated testing? It's two birds with one stone. An interesting addition to the orbital tank farm during the last week has been a set of tanks that were installed where the two old vertical tanks were previously located. We think this hardware is part of the pressurization system for the tank farm, and that it's been installed both to augment and also replace the previous setup located here. On the same day as Ship 28's testing, we got an awesome announcement from the FAA. The agency announced that it had closed out the mishap investigation from the second flight of Starship, ticking another box in the long list of items that need to happen before the next flight. In case you haven't watched it already, we put out a quick video right after the news broke, detailing everything that the FAA said and everything that we learned from this. Just as a quick summary, SpaceX identified 17 corrective items during the investigation to implement on the booster and the ship. It also explained the reason why Booster 9 exploded, with the most likely cause being due to a filter blockage in the liquid oxygen distribution system, which then led to the explosion of one of the engines. As for the ship, the vehicle executed a planned dump of liquid oxygen about seven minutes into flight, but this eventually led to fires and explosions in the aft end of the ship and severed the electronics, which then led to the activation of the automated flight termination system. Now SpaceX needs to show the FAA proof that these 17 corrective actions have been implemented on the current set of vehicles and that they have a reasonable chance of avoiding the mistakes of the second flight. Once that's done, the FAA will be able to proceed with the modification of the launch license to include this next flight. This time around, there are a lot fewer items to go over compared to where we were before flight two. So we expect all of this to take a lot less time with the added bonus that it doesn't seem like the Fish and Wildlife Service is getting involved this time around. Of course, on the day that this news dropped, the thing on all of our minds was what was going to happen next. At some point, Booster 10 had to come back to the launch site so SpaceX could resume full stack testing. While Ship 28 never did any further testing beyond the spin prime, we did see purge tests of the booster quick disconnect and the Raptor quick disconnects, an indication that we were probably close to seeing Booster 10 come back to the pad. We also saw Ship 28 getting its livery, and this time it was in the right orientation. Perhaps SpaceX heard all of us complaining about the layout on Ship 25. With all of this going on at the launch site, activity continued to pace at the production site. I mean, why would it stop? The steamroller has to keep rolling. Now, repeat after me. Work continues on the Star Factory building. It's now a classic, but really, we're seeing some great progress with the new cladding that's being added to the road-facing side of the building. It's definitely starting to look a bit more complete. Another phrase that will probably become another classic is that work continues on the new office building that will be going up right next to the Star Factory. So far, not a lot of work has been done, but there's this clip here showing some of that groundwork ongoing. There's work happening on it, so that's your update on this building. Here at the production site, we also had Ship 29 moving from its work stand inside of Mega Bay 2 down to the high bay. At the time this happened, we didn't know why it was moved, but spoiler alert, that was not the only move it did this week. The day after Ship 28's spin prime happened, we saw Mega Bay 1's door opened. And well, nowadays that's pretty rare. So every time it opens, we take advantage of the opportunity to get a peek inside. This time, it was very easy to see what was going on. Booster 10 had been removed from its work stand and placed on its transport stand, a sign that it was going to roll out to the launch site soon. 
Before we go into that, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that this open doors moment also gave us an opportunity to spot the stacking of Booster 14 as construction of this booster continues inside the Mega Bay. All right, now the moment that we've all been waiting for for the last few weeks, the return of the full stack. That obviously came after Booster 10 rolled out from the production site all the way down to the launch site. It was then later installed on the orbital launch mount via the chopsticks. In an interesting move by SpaceX, teams removed Ship 28 from suborbital pad B right as Booster 10 was being installed on the OLM. They really seem to like doing multiple things at once lately. So as expected, Ship 28 was then rolled out next to the orbital launch mount and finally lifted on Booster 10. This was the first time they stacked a ship with a new modified pin on the chopsticks that is located on the port side of the vehicle. So basically the left one if you were looking at the tower. It seems like some learning was done during this stack as the perfect alignment took a while to achieve and we even saw crews heading up to the ship QD arm while that was happening. If we go back in time, it seems like in some shape or form, SpaceX has had issues with alignment on every single pair of vehicles they've stacked so far. I wouldn't be surprised if we see some serious upgrades and changes being made once the second launch tower is in place and SpaceX can thoroughly work on this first launch pad. Going back to the stacking, just the day before it happened, Ship 29 was rolled out to the pad, which was quite interesting. We now have not only the vehicles for the third flight of Starship out at the launch site, but also this ship for the fourth flight, which is quite mind-blowing to think about. But when we all thought Ship 29 would just go to suborbital pad B straight away, it suddenly moved right next to Booster 10 and Ship 28. Just to throw us a curveball, right when we all expected Ship 29 to just go to the suborbital pads straight away, it was suddenly moved right next to the Booster 10 and Ship 28 full stack. I guess it wanted to join the party, but sorry pal, Booster 10 already had a ship on top. It seems like this was part of a SpaceX photo op ahead of Starship's third flight. I mean, what better way to flex than by rolling out the fourth flight vehicle next to the third flight vehicles? Around this time, we also saw retraction tests of the ship and booster quick disconnects, likely to make sure all is nice and ready ahead of testing. Then, later in the night, as expected, Ship 29 moved back to the suborbital site and was installed on Pad B. With the return of the full stack to the pad, we all expected SpaceX to conduct a wet dress rehearsal on Sunday's window. During a wet dress rehearsal, SpaceX undergoes a simulated countdown with the vehicles on the ground, but without launching them. This rehearsal involves evacuating Starbase and Boca Chica Village, spooling up the tank farm and fully loading the rocket exactly as how it would be loaded on launch day. This is a great opportunity for engineers to test all of the ground systems and the vehicles, which sadly did not cooperate on the first two attempts last month. With this test now behind us, we'll be keeping an eye on what tests may remain for Booster 10 and Ship 28, but hopefully this will be all until launch. Of course, now that Ship 29 is out there, this will be a potential candidate for more testing at the launch site, and we'll of course be going live with commentary once it happens. So that's gonna be it for this week. A lot happened, and there's a lot in store for next week. You all know the best way to follow along is to subscribe if you haven't already, hit the like button, hit the bell, do all the YouTube things. But either way, we'll see you next week with a recap of everything that happens this week as we get closer and closer to Flight 3. So again, thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget, be excellent to each other.